Spring Quarter, Examining Our Faith, Unit 2, The Measure of Faith. Our lesson today is entitled, The Faith of a Centurion, and it's coming from Luke chapter 7, verses 1 through 10, from the New American Standard Version of the Bible. When he had completed all his teaching in the hearing of the people, he went to Capernaum. Now a centurion's slave, who was highly regarded by him, was sick and about to die. When he heard about Jesus, he sent some Jewish elders to him, asking him to come and save the life of his slave. When they came to Jesus, they strongly urged him, saying, He is worthy for you to grant this to him. For he loves our nation, and it was he who built us our synagogue. Now Jesus started on his way with them, but already when he was not yet far from the house, the centurion sent friends saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself further, for I am not worthy for you to enter under my roof. For that reason, I did not even consider myself worth, worthy to come to you, but just say the word and my servant shall be healed. For I also am a man placed under authority with soldiers under myself. And I say to this one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my slave, do this, and he does it. Now when Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him and turned and said to the crowd that was following him, I say to you, not even in Israel have I found such great faith. And when those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the slave in good health. Did you know that Luke's mention of Capernaum is a reminder that the centurion may have already known of Jesus, who had made his home there earlier. And you'll find that in Luke chapter 4, verses 31 and 38. The centurion's faith was grounded in a history of seeing Jesus in action and knowing his reputation. That the centurion's approach demonstrates humility and the sincerity of his respect for God's people. He honored Jesus by not demanding that he cross the Jew-Gentile boundaries. And when he, the centurion, was a social superior of a conquering people and had the right to make that demand. And you'll find that in chapter 7, verses 3, and f 3 4, and 6. And note the different context of worthy here. That the story depicts the essential link between action and faith. It is clear that the centurion's faith drove his actions with the result that his actions demonstrated his faith. You'll find that in chapter 7, verses 4 through 8. That the servant's desperate situation surely prompted the centurion's request, but his history of honoring God and God's people and that's in chapter 7, verse 5. And the limitless trust he placed in Jesus, you find that in chapter 7, verses 6 through 8, demonstrated a sincere faith so alive that it directed even the way he thought and acted. That while Jesus certainly encountered faith within Israel, the centurion's faith was unique in its humility and recognition that Jesus' authority comes directly from God and thus is absolute. That throughout his gospel and the book of Acts, Luke highlights a variety of people both in and outside the margins of Judaism, the poor and Gentiles, showing God's unique care for the vulnerable. God's welcoming love knows no boundaries. It is for all who trust God. Our biblical, historical, geographical, and cultural background. The Jews lived under Roman occupation from
from approximately the 7th century BC until the 5th century AD. This is virtually in the middle of the 1,000 year span of the Roman Empire. Given that the Jews did not care for their Gentile overlords, def definite and decisive were the dividing lines between Jew and Roman. This is especially true of the Roman military charged with keeping the Jews in line. The gospel, however, has a way of removing dividing lines and reaching out to ignite compassion, love, and healing, even between enemies. This was just such a case. Initially, the Roman government did not bother the followers of this new faith that would ultimately be called Christianity. That is because it was seen at first as an extension of Judaism. The Jewish religion was not targeted by Roman authorities because they did not do much proselytizing and therefore were not a threat to Roman religion or society. The Romans also did not force conquered peoples to convert to their religions, one that were tied to a particular people who came from a certain land were legal. Given that early Christianity was attached to Judaism, it was seen in this same light. During this relatively calm period, the incident recorded in our text occurred Later, things changed as the church grew and began to draw new converts to the faith in large numbers. Rome took a harsher approach to this new faith. Persecution was ramped up. The title of centurion was the highest military rank, usually held by men who were not from Rome's elite senatorial or equestrian social classes, yet they played a vital role in the Roman army. At its height, the empire employed around 1,800 legionary centurions. Not all of them held the same position, with some enjoying higher status than others. The primary role fulfilled by centurions, however, was mostly the same. The most important part of the centurion's job was to be a commander of legionaries. Each centurion oversaw a single century, a unit of 80 men, not the 100 it is thought to have been. A note, in battle, a centurion commanded 80 soldiers yet it is still a century of 100 men. The other 20 are just off doing other things. The century was a critical battlefield unit for the Roman army. It was small enough to be flexible, yet large enough to play a significant role in battle. It was the building block from which other formations were made, with the legion, 6,000 troops, being the largest, responsible for discipline and keeping men in line. Centurions were also in a position of tactical command. A Roman soldier sympathetic to the Jews, who was charged with monitoring others and keeping them in line, reached out to Jesus seeking healing for a beloved servant. What an interesting combination, culturally and religiously. This Roman soldier reached out to a Jewish teacher and healer through the agency of other Jews whose homes he was occupying. What an incredible story. Note that this Roman soldier one of some rank and authority did this for a servant 
not for himself. Moreover, he did not just voice his concern. He took action to do something to address the matter. This was someone tasked with watching and keeping order, keeping in check anyone who was a potential threat to Roman rule and authority, including the Jews. Yet he developed a close sympathetic relationship with those Jew Jews under his jurisdiction. He even helped them build a synagogue. It is also a possibility that he was not Roman as the Roman military employed men of various ethnicities. If he was not Roman, then it is likely that his people had been conquered and he joined the Roman army as a mercenary sworn to allegiance. If so, this, then this would explain his Jewish sympathies. He knew what it was like to be conquered. The position came with perks, higher pay, a greater portion of any spools taken in war and command authority even at the lowest level. The fact that this individual may have, like most centurions, come from the plebeian or commoner class may account for his sympathetic, if not empathetic position regarding his servant. He knew what it was like to be of the lower strata of society. One of his perks was to have a servant, which he did, but that servant got sick. Keeping in mind the possible influence of his own early life and the sensitivity and compassion it may have endangered, engendered in him, he tried to help his servant instead of simply dismissing him to fend for himself. He heard about this new teacher rabbi and healer, and reached out to him to heal his servant. For this to happen, there had already been some healing between and among the principal players in this drama, the Jews and the Roman soldier, and the Roman soldier and Jesus. Have you ever been in a situation where you are trying to teach someone how to do something and have them resistant to your instructions? It could be how to ride a bicycle, use a computer, drive a car, or solve a math problem. You begin your instruction and at a point the student says, I can do it from here. You know that he or she cannot but you stop and let the person have it, only to have him or her turn to you in a few moments with a look that says, I need your help. I cannot do this. Please come back and help me. For some people, especially those who are used to being in charge, it is difficult to step back and acknowledge that they need help. That was not the case with Al Centurion. Here was a man who was used to being in control, in command. When he gave orders to the troops under him, they obeyed. In the civilian arena of his personal life, he had a servant who did similarly and took orders from his master. This Centurion, equal to a captain, also had military officers who outranked him from whom he had to take orders. Fortunately, he was the kind of person who had no problems in that regard. He was comfortable taking orders and seeking help if he needed it to accomplish his military task. That same spirit, along with his concern for his servant, led him to Jesus. Once again, we find ourselves looking at an incident in the life and ministry of Jesus
presented in more than one gospel, reflecting slight differences between them. Matthew records this same incident, and immediately we see differences. In Matthew's version, the centurion himself went to Jesus. You'll find that in Matthew chapter 8, verses 5 through 13. He did not send any Jewish friends to approach the master. The conversation between the centurion and Jesus was short and to the point. The centurion told the Lord that he had a sick servant for whom he was seeking healing. Jesus responded immediately, saying that he would go to him. Matthew does not indicate the centurions asking the Lord to come. Jesus just offered to do so. The centurion responded to Jesus, expressing his own, meaning the centurion's, unworthiness regarding the Lord's coming to his home. Say the word, he said to the Lord, and my servant will be healed. The centurion compared his authority with the authority of Jesus, just as he commanded those under him, and they did his bidding. So Jesus can command healing even from a distance, and it will take place. This Roman soldier displayed more respect and honor to Jesus than did or do many of the Lord's own people. Let us look in detail at this story. Our lesson explained. Jesus had just finished a long teaching episode recorded in the previous chapter when he returned to Capernaum. Capernaum near the Sea of Galilee, you'll find that in Matthew chapter 4 verse 13, was one of the most important cities in the life and ministry of Jesus, the only place in which it is recorded that he felt at home. You also find that in Mark chapter 2 verse 1. Many healings took place there in addition to the one in our text today. Jesus healed a paralytic. Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. A man possessed of an unclean spirit. Luke chapter 4, verses 31 through 38. And an official's son. John chapter 4, verses 46 through 54. Some reasons why the centurion took such an interest in the health of his servant were discussed in the geographical and cultural section of this lesson. Use of the phrase valued highly in the text may be one way of expressing that compassion. The servant was valued as a person, a fellow human being, and not just a servant. Though the Bible does not state this, let us believe this to be the case, giving the centurion the benefit of the doubt. Absent the human compassion factor, he could have gotten rid of the servant and replaced him with another healthy one, but he did not. We should also pay attention to the original language. The servant was an enslaved human being. The word used in this instance is slave. It is widely understood that enslaved persons were often instrumental in handling their master's business. As Luke called this man, slave is in the masculine, highly valued. It was likely due to his role as one who was responsible for the centurion's business. The notion of highly skilled and valued slaves was not unique in Roman society. In many instances, an enslaved person was responsible for many of the larger plantations in North and South America, as well as the Caribbean. The enslaved were often those who performed tasks such as accounting, task delegation, 
and skilled labor, such as blacksmithing, carpentry, operating machinery, and midwifery. These persons could and would be rented out as well as act on behalf of his or her supposed owner. It is likely that in addition to his compassion, the centurion wanted to protect his investment, as this enslaved person may have been one who was not easily replaced. He had heard about Jesus and the healings he had performed and wanted to get the master to come and heal his servant. Perhaps taking a page from his strategic military training, he thought, if I, a Roman soldier, go to Jesus seeking help, he will most assuredly refuse me, even though I am asking for someone else. Perhaps I had better ask some of my Jewish friends whom I have come to respect and helped in their religious life to go to Jesus for me. He did not, he did, he did that and they agreed to go, most likely out of gratitude for his support and kindness. What's this? Jewish elders pleading the case, not just of a Roman, of a Roman, but an occupying soldier pleading earnestly. It is a beautiful picture to see two parties who on one hand are at odds, yet on the other hand can simultaneously show or express a mutual concern and respect for each other. This is in a way what the gospel is about. Good news that in this specific instance, sets free the captives who, those seemingly bound by the rules and regulations of the military occupier and the occupied. The power scale between these two factions is balanced in favor of fairness, compassion, mutual respect, love, and gratitude. Just listen to the argument these Jewish elders put forth to Jesus. They had gone to plead the case of someone who had been most kind to them, helping them to build their synagogue. His actions belied his position and status as a Roman soldier who should be keeping them in check, if not seeking to stop any progress they seem to be making. Just the opposite. He had come to share in their faith and the building of a synagogue for their congregation. It is a good point to reference Luke's possible purpose in writing his gospel. It is widely understood that Luke may have been writing as an apologist for the Christian faith. Given that Christianity at this point was a Jewish sect, this interaction between the Jewish advocates, Jesus and the centurion may be pointing to the uncomfortable relations between Jews, Jewish Christians and the Roman occupiers. Using this reasoning, it is possible that their advocacy for this man was a way of placing the occupying forces. In short, it was an act of goodwill for one who had shown them the same. It would be a point they could raise to gain favor with the Romans if trouble ever did arise. In this manner, Jesus, and by extension Christianity, was not a threat to Rome. Rather, Jesus is shown to be a friend to anyone that would come to him. 
The centurion had a servant who was ill. They further explained and for whom he is deeply concerned and seek help, seeks help. He has heard about you and believes you can heal his servant. Please, Lord, come and help him. And Jesus does just that. There are two possible ways to understand or interpret these verses. The first is that someone from the delegation who approached Jesus went back ahead of the master to tell the centurion that Jesus was coming. And the centurion then sent this message to stop him. The other reading is that the centurion had second thoughts after sending his friends to Jesus to the effect that the master did not have to come to him, but say the word and his servant would be healed. He did this not knowing that Jesus was already on his way. Either version depicts great respect for Jesus, his healing powers, and the centurion's faith. That is the point of this lesson. In either case, the centurion demonstrated that he understood that a well-placed word from the right person makes all the difference. His station as a commander gave him a unique perspective as one who does work by his words as opposed to having to do everything himself. His request points to his understanding that Jesus' time was precious, being that he was a person who had many things to do and people to see. In this way, the centurion drew a parallel between himself and Jesus as men of authority. Authority in this way is about writing a new reality with one's words without having to physically be present for the task to be accomplished. For the centurion, authority was demonstrated over his servants and soldiers. Jesus' authority was exercised, exercised in that he was, meaning Jesus, able to command sickness, health, and the body itself. Furthermore, the centurion understood that authority is not self-derived, as he was a man under authority. Whereas he commanded, he only did so because he had the power of the empire at his back. In this short phrase, he showed that he understood Jesus' connection with God. His actions and words should be contrasted with various Jewish leaders who wanted to know by what authority Jesus acted. You'll find that in Luke chapter 20, verse 2. In the same manner, just as the centurion could command because he had the confidence and weight of the empire at his back, Jesus could heal his servant because a word is the only thing that is needed when the supreme being of the universe is empowering him. We have all heard the expression, going the extra mile. In this case, Jesus didn't have to go even a few feet in the direction of the ill servant, let alone an extra mile. Yet there is here, in a sense, a case of the extra mile, spirit or mentally, spirit or mentality. That extra mile is the extraordinary faith of the centurion. We can even see in this story an extraordinary compassion along with the faith factor. The distance between the master and the centurion's home must not have been great. The Bible states when Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd, 
following him. That's verse 9. The message comes from the centurion to Jesus while he was still teaching the people. Perhaps the crowd was following to see another healing miracle. Jesus used that moment to provide an object lesson regarding faith. Jesus remarked that he had not found such great faith even in Israel. This was a subtle inference to the lack of faith of many in Israel. For Luke, this reference demonstrates that the Jesus mission was not just the house of Israel. Jesus was the savior for all the world. It was a Gentile who understood quickly that Jesus can heal from a distance and possesses great power and authority. Whereas Jesus was a Jew and primarily dealt with Jews, the vineyard was the entire world and the fruit would be of every kind, not just the Jews. Apparently, Jesus spoke the word and as a result, when the men who were sent to Jesus returned to the centurion's house, they found the servant healed. All Jesus did was speak the word. This can be referred to as long distance healing. There is no distance regarding the miraculous effect of Jesus's power. Some concluding thoughts and reflections. There are times when the enormity of our problem diminishes our capacity to move forward. How should or do we respond to seemingly impossible problems? When a centurion whose servant was close to death responded in great faith, Jesus was amazed and miraculously restored the servant to full health. One event, two different versions. In either version, the healing took place just as the centurion said and believed it would. The Lord Jesus takes pity and compassion on the poor and distressed, readily offering them relief and healing. Gentile or Jew, it does not matter with him. God's grace is available to and showered upon all, even some we might think do not deserve it. The fact is that we ourselves are recipients and we do not always deserve it. In our reflections, we should find ourselves being filled with faith like the centurion exhibited. We should at first glance, we should at first glance be able to take Jesus at his word and not wait for a confirmation that things will happen as he said. Like the centurion, as witnesses to his greatness, grandeur, and might, we might say, just say the word. Words spoken by God have power. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, our lives constantly need your support and healing. Our churches and homes need your presence. Help us, Lord, to keep ourselves open to the Christ in others and nurture that faith at every opportunity. May we honor you in all ways and never doubt. May we have a simple faith like the centurion. We pray in the name of Jesus, your son. Amen. Have centurion faith.